How do you deal with failure? And what's your advice to young entrepreneurs like me in this case, especially with regards to failure and how to approach it? Yeah, well, if, if, you, if you fail, you really do dust yourself off and you know, get right back mm-hmm. in. I mean, you're, you're going to fail at some things. Uh, uh, you're going to have some human relationships that don't work out. Uh, you know, fairly significant number of people get divorced. I mean, and, you know, that's a very big decision to, to have turn out badly. But uh, I think if you study almost everybody and read read Kay's book, you know, personal history, and you'll everybody fails at some things. I mean, you know, particularly particularly when you're younger. I mean, you know, you you do have less experience in evaluating humans and you know and and just knowing about whatever it may be businesses. Uh, but you know, it, it, it is not fatal. I mean, if you're healthy mm-hmm. and you live in this, particularly living in this country, there's going to be there's going to be an opportunity that comes along. Uh, uh, I got turned on for the Harvard Business School uh, when I was uh, when I got out of the University of Nebraska, you know. And I remember, you know, I went to Chicago to get interviewed. This is when you traveled on the train, and so I spent ten hours going there. And this fellow looked at me, and about ten minutes, he said, "You know, forget it, Bell." <laughs> and, wow. and now I got to go back on the train ten hours and think, well, oh, what, no. "What am I going to tell my dad? What, right. I, what am I going to tell my dad?" I mean, my dad always told me I could do anything you know, and everything. Right. Now I've just got just gotten turned down, uh, you know. But it turned out to be the, one of the best things that ever happened to me because then I went to Columbia where Ben Graham was. It, in fact, I, I, it, it probably even affected who I married because I took a one-year course at Columbia and said two years at Harvard and she might have found some other guy <laughs> during that time. <laughs> and almost everything in my life that looked like a failure has either turned, well, usually it's turned into a success. I mean, it, 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 uh, the world isn't over. You know, it, uh, if you have bad luck in health, that, that's tough. I mean, that, there's just no, there's just, no getting away. I've been lucky on that. But, but the other kind of things, if you're healthy and you're bright and you know, you've got decades ahead of you, you know, if something goes wrong, if you find yourself working for the wrong employer and they're, you know, they're doing things you don't approve of or they're not treating you fairly, you know, the world isn't over yet. You, know, you just go out and, and find somebody else. You're not afraid of failing. You're afraid of failing in front of other people. You will sing in the shower, but you won't sing on the street corner. Why? Because of the other people, because they may see you, because they may laugh at you, because they may say, look at that person, they're so dumb, right? You're not afraid of failing, not, not just by yourself. You're afraid of failing and who is gonna watch. And so that becomes really important because it, it now, means you're living your life based off of other people's expectations and judgments. And maybe that's people in your own family. Maybe that's people you know. Maybe that's your mom. Or maybe that's random people. You're afraid of the judgment of unknown YouTube commenters and <laughs> leaving some kind of feedback on your video telling you how much you suck, right? We're afraid of the people that we care deeply about and their perspective and opinions on us. And we're also afraid of the, the people who we don't know yet who are just out there in the world, on the internet, who might come and leave negativity on whatever you're gonna be creating. So you're not actually afraid of failing. You'll do it all the time, but it's failing and who is gonna see us fail. And so there's a lot to unpack inside of that. Let's start with what is your big goal? What do you wanna accomplish? What mission are you on? Who are you trying to serve? Who are you trying to help? And in order for you to go off and accomplish those things and serve to your highest capability, you're going to have to do things that will be scary, where you're going to risk failure, right? If you are never risking any kind of failure, then you're living your life so small and so safe that you don't like your life. If there's nothing in your calendar in the next month that you are excited by, that your heart's getting, you're you're scared, right? you're nervous, right? You're like, oh my gosh, that thing's happening. If there's nothing in your calendar that's like that, you don't like your life. That That's honestly most people. You're just photocopying your same life over and over and over and over and over again. That's what most people wake up and do. I'm sitting here in the Costco parking lot, right? Like most most people, you just wake up and you're photocopying the same day you had yesterday and last week and last year. And that's not a life. So you have to be willing to risk some kind of failure, which would potentially risk other, how other people see you and judge you. I used to not be able to record videos like this. I mean, the first video I ever recorded in public was I was walking down the street at my old house and 
I was challenged by my agent. He said, you have to record videos in public. Like, Steve, make videos in public. Are you crazy? I can barely make videos at home. I'm going to now make them in public. He's like, you have to do it. Like, okay, great. So I'm walking down the street, carrying my big video camera at the time. And I made sure I picked a really quiet section of the street where nobody was usually outside because uh, it made me feel like I was recording the video and doing the task, but there was nobody around, so I wasn't really doing the task. And uh, I remember there was a male, male, uh, male woman who was dropping off mail. And as soon as I saw her and I felt like I was in auditory range of her, then I pulled the camera down. And then as I passed her, I started filming again. <laughs> it's like, I did the assignment, Steve. Look, I filmed outside. I didn't really do the assignment. Why? Because I'm afraid of of a male woman's opinion of me. Like she doesn't even care about me. She's she's living her life doing her thing. <laughs> and so something like this, now I'm sitting here in a parking lot filming and people are walking by and some people are watching like, what's this guy doing? You just keep going. You just keep making because fear of other people's judgments cannot be a good enough reason for you to play small. Not anymore. Not if you want to do great things. Most of the people judging you don't like their own lives. And any judgment they have of you is a re just a reflection of self. So there's a couple of hacks that I've used to be able to get through it that might serve you. Number one is studying successful people. And anytime you study successful people, you find out that they failed along the way to their success. A lot of times you may just see on the surface just their accomplishments and list of what they've done and all that. And it can feel um, imposing. You know, how are they so perfect and I suck and I have all these fears and insecurities. But if you look deeper into their story and maybe watch some of their interviews or videos, you'll see that they struggled a lot and they had multiple failures on their path to success. And I used to, before my channel came out, I used to read um, stories of different famous entrepreneurs and how they got started and, you know, the, the kind of zero to one story because it made me feel like it was possible that looking at Warren Buffett now is crazy. You know, it's like he's done so much. You, you can't relate. But how did he go from zero to one? And what did he struggle with? And where did he fail? That was inspiring to say, hey, OK, if he could get through that. Now me, decades later, with a lot more opportunity and uh, technology and resources, and I could do that. You know, I could do something similar. So that inspired me to to get out of my cocoon and to be around people who are doing amazing things inspired me to want to go off and do more. It's also why I make videos like this so that you can learn from Warren Buffett and all the people that we profile. And yeah, because I think the more that you're around that, the more you'll win. I don't know Warren Buffett personally. You probably don't. Maybe you do. Maybe you can text him and ask for advice. I can't. Not yet. But I can watch his videos and I can learn from him and I can get better and I can improve myself by being around him. And the more that I watch his videos, the more I can think like him just a little bit. And, and that's important because that shifts you forward. So being around more successful people will, will shift you towards success, even if they are virtual through, through a computer screen, through videos, podcasts, books, etc. The second thing is teaching myself that I do difficult things. And I think that's really important because we've accepted fear as a good enough reason for you not to do the thing. You've accepted other people's opinions as a good enough reason for you not to do the thing. Uh, my trigger words, I call them play bigger triggers. You come up with the triggers that will uh, allow you to play bigger. So if I say scary, difficult or hard, then I go off and do it because I want to be the person who does the things that are scary, difficult or hard to myself. And that's why I still make videos. That's why I write books and speak on stage and find all of those things incredibly scary, difficult and hard. <laughs> so what is it for you? And when you can stop accepting scary, difficult or hard as a good enough reason, like I want to do it, but I'm scared. Okay, well, that's not a good enough reason. You've already set, you've, you've pre-decided that that's not a good enough reason. So you have to go off and do the thing. So scary, difficult, hard. You say it, you write it, you think it, you tell somebody else it. As long as that is the reason for you to put the brakes on your life, it's not a good enough reason anymore. There has to be something stronger than scary, difficult or hard. Otherwise, you have to go and take action and you start to teach yourself that you are the kind of person who takes on things that are scary, difficult or hard. So number one was being around successful people. 
and, and study them and learn from them and get mentorship from them, even if it's just through a video. Number two is that you do difficult things. And then number three is focus on service. And if you understand that the thing that you're afraid to do is not just for you, it's for other people. Right? If you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to create a business, it's not just for you. There's sure there's selfish goals of I wanna I wanna make money and provide for my family and live a great life, etc. But above that needs to be service and helping others, that you're creating something that's gonna bring value to other people, that it's not just about you making money, but you're providing a, a real service, something really valuable to other people that's gonna make their life better. If I'm making videos, it's not just about me and numbers on the channel. It's about it's about you. And hopefully for, for one of you watching this video, it has a big impact today. When I speak on stage or write the books, it's not about me. It's about who I can help serve. And whenever you can deeply connect to who you can help serve, at least for me, it gives me the courage to go off and do the thing. If I'm terrified to speak on stage, I'll often look behind the curtain at the audience and I'll try to find a couple people it's like I'm doing it for that person I'm doing it for him I'm doing it for her I've got a message that I can share that can help them and that gives me the confidence and the courage to go do the thing because we'll show up for other people more than we'll show up for ourselves and so when you can tie what you're doing to other people to value to service to helping them it'll give you more confidence and courage to go off and do the thing that you need to do and so I call that the the push and the hug so the I do difficult things, I do scary things, is the push. Like, get out get out there and do this, Carmichael, let's go. And the service is the hug. Like, hey, I'm not, I'm not doing this just for me, I'm doing it for, for all the people out there as well. And some days you need more of the hug, some days you need more of the push, and you just lean in on what you feel you need most. You know, there are some days when pushing yourself harder is not the answer, you, you need a hug. And there are some days where hugging yourself more is not the answer, you need the push. And so having the self-awareness to know, okay, I need the push right now, or I need the hug right now, and then going off and doing that will give you the momentum that you need. Failure, failure is gonna happen. And the biggest failure, again, is the, the fear of other people seeing you fail. And as long as you live your life by the expectations of other people, you will live small forever. And if you can flip it to say, I'm doing this to help others, I'm doing this because I want to live a great life and I'm doing this because I do difficult things. When you can sh make that shift happen, you start to accomplish your goals. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. I would encourage you, if you're interested in the field, to do a few things. I'd still try and make it as intelligent as possible. I would try to stick with things, businesses I thought I understood. I'd still get out that sheet of paper and I'd write, I'm doing this because, and just test my reasoning. And then I go back and read it a year later and, and see whether what you thought would be true turned out to be true. So I would always check myself. I believe in grading myself on everything. You know, doctors have postmortems and they, they do it because they learn from postmortems. Uh, in business, people don't like to do postmortems. When I'm, uh, I'm, I can be on the board of a company, and they never wanted two years later to run a check on how that decision turned out because it, it can be unpleasant. Uh, but you learn from postmortems, and uh, you don't want to learn. It's way better to learn from other people's mistakes than your own. But you got to learn from a few of your own too. And uh, the time to do it is when you're young. The allowance when I was a little boy was a nickel a week, but. I like the idea of uh, having a little more than a nickel a week to work with, and I went into business very early. I started selling Coca-Cola door-to-door, I sold gum door-to-door, -door, sold Saturday Ink Post, Liberty Magazine, Ladies Home Journal, you name it. <laughs> I think I enjoyed the game almost right from the start. But I like being my own boss. That's one thing I like about delivering papers. I got arranged the route I wanted. Nobody was bothering me at five or six in the morning. When I 
was delivering 500 papers a day, and I made a penny a paper, but in terms of compounding, <laughs> that penny turned into something else. People ask me what they should take in business school, and, and, and uh, uh, or even if they don't go to business school, what they need to know before getting in business, and I tell them, you know, you have to... You have to understand accounting. It's the language. I mean, it, it would be, it's like being in a foreign country without knowing the language if you're in business and you don't understand accounting. So it, 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 you, you want to get as comfortable with that uh, as you are with the English language. It, it, it's made me uh, uh, a lot of money because I, I listened to what Ray Dean had to say 53 or 4 years ago and have been able to understand uh, what I was seeing on pieces of paper, what that told me about businesses, and the limitations of what it told me about businesses. I mean, I Henry Ford, as you may know, failed twice before he started the Ford Motor Company in 1903. I mean, the, the test isn't whether you get the greatest business idea in the world the first time out. The test is whether you keep learning as you go along what your strengths are and what you can do for your customers, what you can bring especially to the party. You need a genuine, a genuine desire day in, day out to delight the customer. I've never, I've never seen a business, and I've seen a lot of businesses, but I've never seen one that delights the customer, that, that doesn't succeed. I mean, what you want is that customer the next day when they think, do I want to rent a car or do I want to buy some furniture? What goes through their mind? You know, it's the place where they've had a great experience. Um, I don't know what I paid for this type. Actually, probably if somebody gave it to me, but for the purposes of this speech, I will <laughs> say, I, I have no idea, but what I, or the shirt I'm wearing, or this, but I do know, I will remember how I was treated when I bought it. I mean, you, you long forget about the price, but you never forget whether you had a good experience or a poor experience uh, with the purchase experience. And I don't need to be uh, in Washington to figure out what the Washington Post uh, newspaper is worth, and I don't need to be in New York to figure out what uh, some other company is worth. It's, it's, it's simply, it's an intellectual process. Well, and uh, and the, less, the less static there is in that intellectual process, really the better off you are. What is the intellectual process? The intellectual process is, is defining your level, defining your area of competence in valuing businesses, and then within that area of competence, finding whatever sells at the, at, at the cheapest price in relation to value. And there are all kinds of things I'm not competent to value, but well, there are a few that I am competent to value. Have you ever bought a technology company? No, I really haven't. In 30 years of investing, not one? I haven't understood any of them. <laughs> so you haven't ever owned, for example, IBM? Which Never owned IBM. Great, Marvelous great. company. I mean, it's a sensational company, but I haven't owned IBM. And so here is this uh, technological revolution going on, and you're not going to be it's a participant. gone right past me. <laughs> is that all right with you? It's okay with me. <laughs> I, don't any... have to, I don't have to make money in every game. I mean, I don't know what cocoa beans are going to do. I don't, you know, I, I, there are all kinds of things I don't know about. And that may be too bad, but... Uh, you know, why should I know all about them? I haven't worked that hard on them. In the securities business, you literally every day have thousands of the major American corporations offered to you uh, at a price and a price that changes daily. And you don't have to make any decisions. You have to make, uh, nothing is forced upon you. So you, there are no called strikes in the business. The pitcher just stands there and throws balls at you. And uh, if you're playing real baseball and it's between the knees and the shoulders, you either swing or you got a strike call on you. If you get too many call on you, you're out. In the securities business, you sit there and they throw uh, U.S. Steel at 25 and they throw General Motors at 68 and you don't have to swing at any of them. They may be wonderful pitches to swing at, but if you don't know enough, you don't have to swing. And you can sit there and watch thousands of pitches and finally you get one right there where you want it, something that you understand, and then you swing. I've got this rule, rule you know, the first rule is don't lose and the second rule is never forget the first rule. So it really isn't so much having a lot of brilliant decisions, it's just not really having some terrible ones. And and. And frankly, I did learn from Ben Graham how to avoid ever having any disasters in investments. Uh, it, it wasn't that you were going to come up with the very smartest thing, but if you never have any any significant losses, you know, some singles and doubles will produce a lot of runs before you get through. Leadership at, at Berkshire really consists of taking a bunch of people 
who in a baseball uh, uh, analogy would be 400 hitters and just handing them the bat and just telling them to get up their plate and take a big swing. Uh, uh, there's very little to it beyond that. One thing I do is I send them a letter. The only thing I tell them, and this letter, which went out January 20th, 2003, it says it's been two and a half years since my last memo. Now, how many big companies have, do you have the managers out there have been two and a half years since they've heard from the home office? It's been two and a half years since my last memo. Here are a couple things to keep in mind. And number one, and this is number one every time, this doesn't change, it won't change two years from now or four years from now or six years from now. Number one, we can afford to lose money, even a lot of money. We cannot afford to lose reputation, even a shred of reputation. Let's be sure that everything we do in business can be, be, be reported on the front page of a national newspaper in an article written by an unfriendly but intelligent reporter. In many areas, including acquisitions, Berkshire's results have benefited from its reputation, and we don't want to do anything that in any way can tarnish it. Last year, Berkshire was ranked by Fortune as the fourth most admired company in the world. This year, we were third in the United States. They just published it. It took us 37 years to get there, but we could lose it in 37 minutes. And that's the message. I mean, we, you know, we, we can lose money. It does, you know, nicer to make money, but we've got, we'll figure out ways to make money. But we can't lose a, we can't lose a shred of reputation because you don't get it back. If you look around you at the people you admire, you know, they have certain qualities. I mean, you've got, you've got friends, why do you like them? You know, generally, you know, the, they, 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 generally, they have an upbeat attitude on life. Generally, they are generous people. They're humorous people. They're people that do more than their share. They're people that are thinking about something nice they can do for you. And all of those qualities attract you. And none of those are, are innate at birth. I mean, you, you can acquire those. And then there's other people that turn you off. You know, and and uh, uh, they have habits. They take credit for things they didn't do. They don't show up on time. Whatever it may be. They're a little dishonest about things. And... If you're looking at your life at, at a young age like you are, and you can choose what kind of a person you can be, why not be the person you admire rather than the person you can't stand? It's so simple. So just write down the qualities you like. Take your, take your five best friends. Why do you like them? And just write down those qualities. And you will find there's no quality there that you can't have yourself. And similarly with the five people you can't stand to be around, <laughs> put, those, put those things down that turn you off about those people. And... If they turn you off about them, why should you possess them? You're gonna, uh, it's, it's so simple. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, not like, it's not like some, something complicated that you think you should be learning you know, with an advanced degree in school. It's not as complicated school. as investing in the stock market. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's, it's enormously important to have people work with you in life. Right. They're going to work with you in life if they like you. You know, and they may occasionally, I mean, if you're in the army or something, you know, you may work for somebody that you don't like. But by and large, you're going to get the best out of people if they feel good about you. And it's just so easy, but you've got to develop the habits early because you can't say I'm going to suddenly become a terribly attractive person when I'm 60. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> uh, so pick up the right habits now. And I will guarantee you, if you actually just write down those qualities, and think about it, you will find you can have every one of the attractive qualities, get rid of the ones that are, are negative, That's and true. your life will be different. I like to read more than most kids. I really like to read a lot. My Aunt Edie gave me a copy of the World Almanac, and that was heaven to me. And I can still tell you that the almost population was 214,006 in 1930. Some numbers just kind of stick with you. And very early, probably when I was seven or so, I took this book out of the Benson Library called A Thousand Ways to Make a Thousand Dollars. And one of the ways in this book was having penny weighing machines. And I sat and calculated how much it would cost to buy the first weighing machine and then how long it would take for the profit for that one to buy another one. And I would sit there and create these compound interest tables to figure out how long it would take me to have a weighing machine for every person in the world. The first books I read on investment were actually in my dad's office. Pretty soon I read all the books in the office and read some of them more than once. A few years ago, I went to Amazon and sure enough, they had this manual there. So while reliving my youth, other guys were going to Amazon probably in, in a 
buying old Playboys or something, but I bought old Moody's manuals instead. And when I got out of school, I started selling stocks. I was 20 years old at the time and looked about 16 and acted about 12. So I was not the most impressive salesperson that anybody ever met. Uh, but what I would do was I, I went through page by page looking for possibly undervalued stocks. Yeah, I, well, I made, I made a lot of mistakes. The biggest mistake, in, uh, well, not the biggest, necessarily the biggest, but, but buying Berkshire Hathaway itself was a mistake because Berkshire was a lousy textile business. And I bought it very cheap. I'd been taught by Ben Graham to buy things on a quantitative basis. Look around for things that are cheap. And that I was taught that, we'll say, in 1949 or 50. It made a big impression on me. So I went around looking for what I call use cigar butts of stocks. And the cigar butt approach to buying stocks is that you walk down the street and you're looking around for cigar butts and you find this, honestly, this terrible looking, soggy, ugly looking cigar, one puff left in it. But you pick it up and you get your one puff. It's disgusting, you throw it away, but it's free. I mean, it's cheap. And then you look around for another soggy, you know, one puff <laughs> cigar. Well, that's what I did for years. It's a mistake. Uh, although you can make money doing it, but you can't make it with big money. It's so much easier just to, to buy wonderful businesses. So now I would rather buy a wonderful business at a fair price than a fair business at a wonderful price. But in those days, I was buying cheap stocks. And Berkshire was selling below its working capital per share. You got the plants for nothing. You got the machinery for nothing. You got the inventory and receivables at a discount. It was cheap. So I bought it. And 20 years later, I was still running a lousy business, and that money did not compound. You really want to be in a wonderful business, because the time is the friend of the wonderful business. You keep compounding, it keeps doing more business, and you keep making more money. Time is the enemy of the lousy business. I could have sold Berkshire, perhaps liquidated it, and made a quick little profit, you know, one puff. But staying with those kind of businesses is, 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 is a big mistake. So you might say I learned something out of that mistake, and I would have been way better off taking what I did with Berkshire is I kept buying better businesses. I started the insurance business, the seized candy, the buffalo, all, all kinds of things. I would have been way better doing that with a, with a brand new little entity that I'd set up rather than using Berkshire as the platform. Now I've had a lot of fun out of it. I mean, everything in life seems to turn out for the better, so I, I, I don't have any complaints about that, but it was a dumb thing to do. I went into U.S. Air. I bought a preferred stock in 1989. Uh, as soon as my check cleared, the company went into the red and never got out. I mean, it was a, a really dumb. I mean, it, it, uh, I've got an 800 number I call now whenever I think about buying an air, airline stock. I call them up any hour that, fortunately, I can call them at 3 in the morning, and I just dial and I say, my name's Warren, I'm an aeroholic, you know, and I'm thinking about <laughs> buying this thing, and then they talk me down. I mean, it takes out. <laughs> It takes, takes hours sometimes, but it's worth it, believe me. Uh, if you ever think about that airline, uh, buying an airline stock, call me and I'll give you the 800 number because you, know, you, you don't want to do it. Uh, but we got lucky in terms of how we eventually came out on it. But it was a dumb, dumb decision. If you tell me who your heroes are, I can tell you how you're going to turn out to quite an extent uh, by this point in life. And, and I, I, I have been extraordinarily lucky in that None of my heroes ever let me down. I mean, I, the ones I uh, came up with uh, throughout their lives, uh, I've never felt that I've been let down in any way with it. Number one was my dad, and, and uh, uh, had a huge impression on me. Uh, my wife, who was here, is, is one of my heroes. I mean, she is, uh, you know, in, in terms of, of uh, she's taught me a tremendous amount, and, and, and uh, never seen anybody any better with human beings than, than, than she is. And, uh, uh, you can, you know, Yogi Berra again said you can, you can observe a lot just by watching. And uh, I, I uh, you know, I, I watched my dad and I, I've watched her and uh, I had a, a professor, Ben Graham, uh, back at Columbia and had a huge impact on me. So I have been lucky in that I've had terrific heroes and they, they haven't let me down. And, and uh, uh, that that takes you a long, long way. I, I've gone through one or two periods where th th we're kind of tough in life, but uh, not. Any, I mean, every, everybody's had had that. But but having the right heroes will take you right through it. If you buy a business, if you buy a farm, you know, do you go up and look, you know, every couple of weeks to see how far the corn is up, and uh, you know, do you worry too much about whether somebody says this is going to be a year of low prices because exports are being affected or anything like that? You know, you buy a farm, 
and you hold it for, I've got one farm that I bought in the 1980s and my son runs it, but I've, I've been there once, you know. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't grow faster if I go and stare at it, you know, I can't cheer for it, you know. More effort, more effort, or something like that. And I know there's gonna be some years when prices are gonna be good and some when the prices aren't gonna be good. I know there's years when yields will be better than others. But about the farm, and, and uh, if, it, it just doesn't, I don't care about economic predictions on it or anything of the sort. I do care that over, over the years it's well tended to in terms of rotating crops, and I hope yields get better, which they generally have. In fact, that farm 100 years ago would have probably produced 30 bushels, maybe 35 bushels of corn per acre, and now in a good year, you know, it'd be 200. I mean, we've really made progress in this country. That's one reason commodity prices, if you go back a couple hundred years, they've moved so little, is because we've just gotten better and better at whether it's cotton or whether it's, it's corn or soybeans or all kinds of things. And you and I have benefited from that. And so apples, kind of like a farm. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a long term investment. And, and if you own, if you own the, the best auto dealership in town, uh, the best brand, and you had a, somebody good running it, you wouldn't drop by every day and say, you know, how many people have come in today? Or, you know, I think interest rates are going up a little. Maybe it'll slow down our sales or anything. No, you buy it knowing there's 365 days a year. And, you're going to own it for 20 years, so that's 7,300 days, and you know they're going to things are going to be <laughs> different from day to day and year to year. You shouldn't buy it if the day to day stuff is important. Well, so speaking of resources, let's talk a little bit about your decision to put your money with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. Mm -hmm. uh, you are somebody, obviously, who's you know arguably, not even arguably, definitively by numbers, the best in the world in terms of figuring out how to allocate capital. I mean, dollars don't lie and then put it to work, and yet with philanthropy, you, out, you basically outsourced it. How, how did that how Well, that, that's true, but you know, when my wife had a, a baby, I didn't deliver it either. I mean, I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't fill my kids' teeth. I mean, you know, I, I, Adam Smith in 1776 explained specialization of labor, and he did a pretty good job of it. And, and I feel I'm very good at, at, at piling up money, and, and my wife was very good at unpiling it. I mean, it, it's a very simple formula, and she was going to handle the philanthropy big time, and she, and she did during her lifetime at a, at, a, at a moderate level, but basically I was going to turn it all over to her to handle, and I would pile up during my lifetime, and, and she died bef you know, earlier, and, and therefore I had to make a decision as to what was the best way to use a very large sum of money uh, and, and get my goals achieved through other people. And uh, there are other people that are better than I am at all kinds of things. I mean, A-Rod's here. I mean, you know, we're not gonna get into a home run derby. <laughs> so, so I believe in, I believe in, uh, I, I really do believe in getting people that are younger, more energetic, but also experienced. And in the case of Bill and Melinda, have their own money up as well. And they've got similar, they've got identical objectives really with me. And if I can get them to do the work and I can keep having right. fun doing what I do, I'll do it. And they have skin in the game, like sure. you said. So. I bought the first shares of Berkshire in 1962 and it was a northern textile business destined to become extinct eventually. And uh, it was a statistically cheap stock in a terrible business. Berkshire Hathaway was closing mills, and as they closed the mills, it would free up some capital, and then they would repurchase shares. So I bought some stock with the idea that there would be another tender offer at some point, and we would sell the stock at a modest profit. And at one point, the management asked me at what price we would tender our stock, and I said $11.50. And the tender offer came out a few months later, and uh, it was at eleven dollars and three eighths, which was an eighth of a point cheaper. And that made me very mad. So I just started buying more stock. I just felt that I'd been double crossed by the management. And in May of 1965, I bought enough so we controlled the company. One of the reasons Warren's successful is he's brutal in appraising his own past. He wants to identify misthinkings and avoid them in the future. But it was an accident that he chose Berkshire Hathaway. If the chairman hadn't tried to cheat him out of an eighth, there wouldn't have been any Buffett-Berkshire Hathaway history. 
If you're emotional about investment, you're not going to do well. You may have all these feelings about the stock. The stock has no feelings about you. Looking back, it's interesting, that tender offer, I didn't realize it, but it, it happened about five days after my dad had died. And I, whether that had affected me or not, I don't know. Well, I was lucky that I got started early. I mean, it always helps if you get started early. And, and, and my dad happened to be in the investment business, so I would go down to his office on Saturdays. And so at age probably seven or something, I started reading these books that were around the place. And so I had a 15-year jump on many people in, in a sense, and that, that helped a lot. And, and I was always fascinated by them. I knew what I wanted to do early, and I think that's a, that's a huge advantage too. And then you don't need... You don't need a lot of brains in this business. I mean, I've always said if you got an IQ of 160, give away 30 points to somebody else because you don't need it in investments. What you do need is emotional stability. You have to, you have to be able to think independently, and you have to be, you have to be. When you come to a conclusion, you have to really not care what other people say, and 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 just follow the facts and follow your reasoning. And and that's that's tough for a lot of people. But, uh, that part, I, I think, I was just lucky with. I was born that way. In terms of uh, emotions, it's a truism that investing emotions are your enemy. Absolutely. That uh, when the market's good, if you feel good, don't. If you feel bad, you should probably do it. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, how, uh, how, how did you, uh, what, what was that extra thing where uh, so many will acknowledge that, and yet we saw in the current crisis, they, they panicked while you went into seemingly uh, potential disasters like GE and uh, Goldman Sachs. Yeah. I can't really tell you the answer. I mean, I didn't learn in school or anything. I just, it never bothered me if people disagreed with what I thought, uh, as long as I felt I knew the facts. I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of things I don't know a thing about. I just stay away from those. Uh, so I stay within what I call my circle of competence. You know, that uh, and Tom Watson said it best. He said, you know, he said, he said, I'm no genius, but I'm smart in spots, and I stay around those spots. Well, I try and stay around those spots, and I, I just don't have a a problem if if uh, if somebody says you know you're wrong on something I just I go back and look at the facts and and, and it, I think that I think that really is much more important frankly than than having a few points of IQ or or having an extra course or two in in school or anything of the sort you need emotional stability by far the best investment you can make is in yourself I mean that for example communication skills I tell the students that come that uh, they're going to graduate schools and business and they, they're learning all these complicated formulas and all that. If they just learn to communicate better, and both in writing and in person, they increase their value at least 50%. And, you know, I mean, it, it, uh, if you can't communicate, somebody says, you know, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Nothing happens, you know, basically. And, and you have to be able to get, get forth your ideas. And, uh, and that's, that's relatively easy. I did it myself with a Dale Carnegie course. Some people wish I'd taken a shorter course now <laughs> in terms of my talking later on. But it, it, it's just hugely important. And you, if you invest in yourself, nobody can take it away from you. Well, I look at a lot of figures just in connection with our, our businesses. I, I, uh, I like to get numbers. <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm getting reports in weekly in some businesses. Uh, uh, that, but that doesn't tell me what the economy is going to do six months from now or three months from now. It, it tells me what's going on now with our businesses. Uh, uh, and it really doesn't make any difference in what I do today in terms of buying stocks or buying businesses, what those numbers tell me. They're interesting, but they're not, they're not guides to me. Uh, if, if we buy a business, we're going to hold it forever. So we're, we're going to have good years, bad years, in-between years, maybe a disastrous year some year. <laughs> and... and uh, we, we care a lot about the price. We do not care about the next 12 months. Economic predictions just don't enter into our decisions. Charlie Munger, my partner, and I, in you know, 54 years now, we've never made a decision based on an economic prediction. We, we make business predictions about what individual businesses will do over time, and we compare that to what we have to pay for. But we have never said yes to something because we thought the economy was going to do well in the next year or two years, and we've never said no to anything because we were right in the middle of a panic even if the price was right. You know, how do you turn failure into a plus? Uh, and it's true. When I was at the University of Nebraska, one day I was reading the Daily Nebraskan, and it said in room 300 or something, at 3 o'clock there will be this panel of three uh, uh, professors here at the 
University, and they were going to award the Nathan Gold Scholarship. I don't know whether you still, do you still have that around? And at the time, uh, it said it would give you $500 to go to the graduate school of your choice. I don't know whether it's changed in amount, but, but that, that was it. So I read this, and I went there to this room at 3 o'clock that day, or whatever it was, and I walked in the room, and there were the professors, and I was the only student that showed up. I mean, it really got to them. I mean, they, they were stuck. They, they, you know, they kept waiting and looking at their watch and hoping there'd be more candidates, but there, no one came in. So I won $500 by, by default. And uh, <laughs> now those are usually my biggest triumphs when nobody else shows up. Uh, <laughs> and so here I was, I had $500 to go toward any, it wasn't, it wasn't limited, it was any, any graduate school uh, for a master's degree. So I applied to Harvard, my dad wanted me to, and uh, uh, I shortly heard from Harvard, and they said, go to Chicago and meet this fellow running that, who interviews applicants from the Midwest. So I got on the train, and that's what you did in those days, and I spent about 10 hours on the Burlington going to Chicago. Then I transferred to another little interurban train to go up to this country day school where this fellow was the headmaster and he was the big interviewer for Harvard. And I got there and after about 10 minutes he, he said, yeah, better think about something else. But, uh, you know, he uh, come back later on. I was, I was 19 at the time and uh, I looked about 12, you know, and, and, I, and I acted about eight. Uh, so it was not a great combination. Uh, but. So he, he said, forget it. So I spent, uh, took the little interurban train back to Chicago, and I took the 10-hour train back to Omaha, and all the time I think, you know, what do I tell my parents? You know, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, but it was, it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. I, because if I'd gone to Harvard, I would have gone to a two-year business school. I, I, I instead applied to Columbia, where I could graduate in one year and get a master's degree. Luckily that by the accident of it and being in the Nebraska National Guard, which did not get called up for the Korean War, I missed going in the Korean War. I, I got to meet Ben Graham, and, which had an enormous effect on me subsequently. And I probably got my wife that way because she was going to Northwestern. And I was able to put on sort of a full court press because I got out in one year. And otherwise, uh, She'd, she'd have met some other guy. I mean, I, I got her before the competition showed up. And uh, so it worked out wonderfully. It couldn't have worked out better. And that's been, that's been my life, basically. I mean, it, uh, things, you know, you will get some disappointments, you know. Uh, but if I knew every decision I was going to make was going to be perfect, it would not be as much fun. It'd be like playing golf and knowing you're going to hit a hole in one on every hole. You wouldn't play golf if every time you got on a tee, you just took a swing and the ball ended up in the hole. You know, be fun for a few days and you get, get on TV, but it, the, the game would not be any fun. Uh, so it's failure, you know, and I wouldn't even consider them failures, but they're, they're mistakes or whatever you want to call it. They're they're part of the game, and in the end, you know, you go on and and we've made plenty of mistakes in business. We'll make plenty more, and the, the you know the Babe Ruth and you know for a long time it subsequently got eclipsed by. A few fellows, but uh, he held the record for strikeouts. You know, he also the, held the record for home runs and was the highest paid baseball player until the modern era came along. Uh, so it's it's part of the game. If you take big swings, you know, you you, you may you may uh, you're going to miss sometimes. I would like to tell you of two women uh, that each sold a business to Berkshire Hathaway uh, to me, actually, for many, many, many millions of dollars. Both of them started with $2,500. By a coincidence, it was the exact same amount. It was everything they had in the world. And one of them was a woman who landed in Seattle in 1917, couldn't speak a word of English, had a tag around her neck. The tag said, uh, Fort Dodge, Iowa, the Red Cross, got her to Fort Dodge, where she was reunited with her husband, who had come to the country a couple of years earlier. And she lived in Fort Dodge for two years, and as she put it, she felt like a dummy. She couldn't pick up the language. She couldn't learn a word. 
And so she decided, she and her husband decided to move to Omaha. So they came to Omaha in 1919, and there she found a small colony of Russian Jews, so she started feeling more at home. And then as her oldest daughter went to school, she would come home, this daughter, Frances, and she would teach her mother the words she would learned in school that day. And this woman, Rose Brumpkin, spent 20 years saving money, bringing first her siblings over, her mother and father, $50 at a time. She sold used clothing to do it. She had four children during this period. And by 1937, after 20 years, she'd saved $2,500. She went to Chicago and she bought what she could of furniture. Her dream had always been to open a furniture store. And this woman without, who had never gone to school one day in her life with $2,500, but with the same spirit that the people in this room had about having a dream and working to accomplish that dream, she built a business which she <clears throat> sold to me in 1983 for $60 million approximately, and which, which did a billion and a half dollars worth of business last year. <clears throat> the fourth generation is working in that business. This woman, Rose Blumpkin, lived, well, she, she worked for me until she was 103. And then she, I'm not, she said, then she retired and she died the next year, which is a lesson to all of Berkshire's <laughs> managers that Premature retirement, you know, nothing, you can't tell what's going to happen. But Mrs. B, with her $2,500, one further fact about her, she could not read or write. And she went into a furniture business, and she didn't bring anything in unique in furniture, but she brought a determination to succeed. She knew she could outwork anyone else. She knew that she cared about her customers, she worked at very low gross margins, but she built this incredible business. Warren, what do you consider the most important quality for an investment manager? It's a temperamental quality, not an intellectual quality. You, you don't need tons of IQ in this business. I mean, you have to have enough IQ to get from here to downtown Omaha, but, uh, but uh, you do not have to be able to play three-dimensional chess or, or be in the top leagues in terms of bridge playing or something of the sort. Uh, you need a stable, personality. You need a temperament that neither derives great pleasure from being with the crowd or against the crowd. Because this is not a business where you take polls, it's a business where you think. And Ben Graham would say that you're not right or wrong because a thousand people agree with you. And you're not right or wrong because a thousand people disagree with you. You're right because your facts and your reasoning are right. How do you know when to throw in the towel on an investment or a business? Uh, when you throw in the towel on an no, uh, investment or business. Or business? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, you, what you know is you do it too late. <laughs> I've done, I, I went in the textile business by accident in 1965, and I threw in the towel about 20 years later. And that was about 20 years too late. <laughs> the, there's a great tendency to want to uh, hold on, justify old decisions. I mean, that's a human, human trait. And uh, what when you really know you've got a bad business is when you have a good manager and you're getting bad results. I mean, it, it, when, you, when, you're, when you're getting bad results with a bad manager, you still have to examine the question of whether you, know, you can get better results if you get a better manager. Usually you can't. You know, I've, I've said in the past you know, that when a, when a management with a reputation for excellence encounters a business with a re reputation for bad economics, it's the reputation of the business that remains intact. And, <laughs> and I've proved that many times. <laughs> uh, uh, there are businesses that are just plain tough. You know, and there's the, there, there, they, there may be too many competitors, but there's reasons why they don't drop out. There's reasons, well, we, we started out in textiles and we made over half of the, uh, the linings for men's suits in the country. And we, we went through World War II and got awards and, and Sears Roebuck named us their supplier of the year and all of that sort of thing. And uh, then we'd say, well, we'd like to increase the price of 
of these linings a quarter of a cent a yard in Sears, but you must be out of your mind. There's 10 other guys that will sell it to us at the old price. And nobody ever went into a Sears store and said, I'd like a, a blue serge shirt, a blue shirt, serge suit with a Hathaway lining. You know? <laughs> it, it didn't exist. We had no connection to the consumer. And there are lots of lousy businesses, you know, and there's lots of wonderful businesses. And my job over the years has been to try and figure out which is which, and I've made plenty of mistakes. I bought a company called Dexter Shoes. In the early 90s, I paid 400 plus million dollars for it, and it, it made a lot of money before I bought it. But, you know, as soon as I bought it, they pulled some switch or something, and it, it, it <laughs> immediately started losing money. And, uh, and it was because of foreign competition and so on, or it was, maybe it was because I owned it, I don't know. Uh, and it went to zero. And the worst thing was that I paid for it in stock, so that 400 million in stock I gave at the time is uh, now worth about five billion. So, it, it, uh, so uh, every time Berkshire stock goes down, I feel a little bit better because of my <laughs> opportunity <laughs> loss on this business. But you know, when I looked at Dexter Shoe, they had a good position in retailers, they turned out good shoes, they had a great workforce, all kinds of things. But I just forgot one thing, that that they weren't gonna make shoes in the United States anymore. <laughs> so you make, you, you make mistakes, and it does pay to recognize quickly when you've made them. If, you, if you've got a good person running a business and it isn't making any money, uh, you, you know, you're in the wrong business, and, and you've gotta face up to that. When you get to my age, you will not measure how well you've done by how much money you've got. I can guarantee you that. You'll, you'll all do fine on money anyway. I mean, uh, you know, think about it. Seven hours a day, you know, you're in a bed. You've got exactly the same mattress I've got. If you don't, we'll sell it to you at the furniture mart. You know, I mean, so, so that, I mean, we're on a parody. I can't, I can't outdo you, you know, in terms of my sleeping enjoyment. You can, you can match it by, by buying this mattress, which will give you a special price on it. Just mention my name. Uh, <laughs> we eat at the same places, you know. We eat at Dairy Queen, particularly if you're in my position because we own it, but, but we eat at McDonald's and Burger King and, and, when I leave here, I'll stop by a fast food place. I mean, I had a 10-year-old car up till about a year ago, you know, and it just doesn't make any difference to me. They, they all work. We live in a place that's warm in the winter and it's cool in the summer, and we watch the Super Bowl on big screen TV. You do it, I do it. You know, we dress more or less the same. I mean, I pay more for my clothes, but they look cheap when I put them on, so we're really on a, we're on a parody, yeah. So, so the money isn't going to be that big a deal. Everybody in this country is going to, you know, the, with the intelligence this group has and the energy, you have, you're gonna do well. So what's the difference? You know, what really counts? Well, I would say that you will measure, health is enormously important, and that's a matter of a fair amount of luck. I mean, you know, so I won't, I don't want, I'm not shortchanging it, I'm just saying you can't do too much about that. But you will measure your success in life by whether, by how many, and the extent, whether it's the people you want at 70 or whatever the age may be, you'll measure it by how many of them really love you, you know, in the end. I mean, you can't, you know, you, you, you can't buy love. I mean, it, it doesn't work. You can buy sex, you can buy testimonial dinners, you can buy your name on buildings, you can do all kinds of things. But the, you know, the only way you get to be, you know, love is to be lovable. It's kind of irritating, actually. If you've got a lot of money, it'd be more fun to just write out a check for a million dollars. So everybody, you know, from now on loves me. But it doesn't work that way. And in fact, you know, it, it, the only way is to be is to be lovable, and, and you know I've got this friend who uh, who came out of Auschwitz and had a, at least one member of the family die there, and what is it now? It's uh, 60 years later. You know she still, when she looks at people, it's a Polish Jew, when she looks at people, the question she asks herself in determining who she really trusts as friends. The one question in her mind is, would they hide me? Now, when you get to be 70, if you've got a lot of people that would hide you, you've had a successful life. I know people who have a tremendous amount of money, no one would hide. Their own kids wouldn't hide them. I mean, they, they really wouldn't. I mean, their business associates wouldn't or anybody else. If it really came down to it, you know, they, they don't have anybody's respect. They've got their attention maybe with money or something of the sort, but they, they, nobody loves them. And uh, my friend Tom Murphy at Cap Cities TV, I mean, dozens of people would hide Murph, you know. All kinds of people would, would hide my wife, you know. 
that uh, Ben Graham, a lot of people would have. My, my dad had, it would have had a number. And then, like I say, the, I, can, I can tell you people that, uh, you know, everybody may pay homage to them, and the kids may put up with them and hope they don't change their will or something, but the truth is that nobody would hide them. And if you've got a lot of people that would hide you when you get to be 70, uh, you will have had a very successful life. Everything you do learn is cumulative. I mean, that doesn't mean that industries stay good forever or businesses stay good forever, but, but learning to think about business models what I learned at 20 is useful to me now. What I learned at 25 is useful to me now. And so it's not, it's not, so, it's not a field that changes dramatically in terms of the underlying principles. It's like physics. I mean, there's underlying principles. Now, they're doing all kinds of things with physics they weren't doing 50 years ago. But, but if, if you've know if, if you got the principles, if you know what makes a good business, if you know what makes a good manager, you know, if you know what makes a, a, a good product, uh, and you learn that, in one business, you can, there is some transference to other businesses you go along, and you learn what things you, you're not gonna understand. I mean, knowing what to leave out is just as important as knowing what to focus on. <laughs> and uh, I don't think I can win every game. You know, Somebody said, how do you beat Bobby Fischer? You play him any game except chess. <laughs> so I don't play Bobby <laughs> Fischer chess. <laughs> and that's, there's a lot of value to learning that over time and, and, and learning what you're good at and what you're not good at. You know, the most important thing, uh, aside from the things I've talked about already, is, is really who you associate with. You want to associate with people that are better than you are. I mean, basically, you'll go in the direction of the people that you associate with. And, and you want to have the right heroes. Uh, you want people, if you want to emulate somebody, you better pick very carefully who you want to emulate. And, uh, and when, obviously, you can't pick your parents. Uh, uh, they're gonna have enormous influence on you, but you don't get a choice on that. But you get choices as you go down the line. And you, uh, who, you, uh, who you admire, who you, who, you, who you want to copy, and the most important for most people in terms of that decision is their spouse. It's also important in terms of a partner in business, but the partner in life is, is the most important one. You, know, you want to pick a spouse that's, little, that's better than you are, <laughs> and then he or she, and, hope, and you hope they don't f figure it out too fast. <laughs> All of you in this room have the brains to do extremely well in life. You've all got the energy to do extremely well in life, and then the question is, how do you apply it? If you've got a 200 horsepower motor, do you get 200 horsepower out of it? Do you get your full potential, or do you get 100 horsepower or 50 horsepower? Now, there's two things that can hold you back in getting the full horsepower out of your, your engine, whatever it may be. All of you have big enough engines. And one of those is a lack of education, but that probably isn't gonna happen to very many people in this room. If you did have a lack of education, if you, didn't, if you didn't have a chance to get a decent education in life, it wouldn't make any difference what that potential was because you'd never unlock it. But the second most important thing, and equally as important, is in terms of the habits that you develop, in terms of what you do with yourself. When we hire people, we look for three qualities. We look for integrity, we look for intelligence, and we look for energy. But if they don't have the first one, integrity, the other two will kill you. Because if you're hiring somebody without integrity, you really want them to be dumb and lazy, don't you? I mean, you know, the last thing in the world you want for them is to be smart and energetic. So smart and energetic only goes with integrity. You can't change your IQ or how far you can throw a football or how high you can jump or the color of your hair very easily. But you can elect to have integrity that matches anybody else's. And if you match that with intelligence, which you have, and energy, which you have, uh, you will get an extraordinary result and you'd be very foolish to sell me 10% of yourself for 50,000. On the other hand, if you don't match it with that, your potential will, in a significant part, go unused. What other habits did you cultivate in your 20s and your 30s that you now see as being foundational to your success as a business person? Yeah, well, I, I knew a lot about what I do uh, when I was 20. I mean, I, I, I really read a lot and, and uh, I aspired to learn everything that I could about the subject. So intellectually, I knew a lot. I did not know a lot about human behavior. I mean, that, that you can't learn really out of reading books, but it's, it's very important to understand people. And uh, I say to the students, you know, just imagine you could buy or you, or you could be given 
10% of the future earnings of one person that you know, among everybody you know. Now, are you going to pick the person that's the smartest? Are you going to pick the person that can dance the best or that can run the fastest or anything like that? That's the right height. No, anything. No, no. There, you're going you're gonna to pick the person that has the right habits, that, that is cheerful, generous, gives other people credit for what they do. You know, and when you look at all of the qualities that you admire in other people, mm-hmm. which would cause you to pick that person, say to yourself, which of those qualities can't I have myself? Because they are, you know, you determine whether you have them. So just write them down on a piece of paper. What, who is the person that you admire the most or like the best? Why do I like them? And just write down and then say, which of these can I do myself? And the truth is you right. can do them. And then you also, if you really want to carry it to the next extreme, you pick the person you dislike the most. And why do you dislike that person? You know, and, and you know they always—they're never fair about things. Basically, they always claim more credit than they're due and everything. And write down those qualities and say, if you dislike that in some other person, why in the world right. would you want to have those yourself? So you just get rid of those. And it's—it's it's a pretty simple thing to do, but you want to be the person that if you could pick your best friend. You know, uh, that you would have the same qualities. I'm 72. I'm getting Social Security now. So, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I should be in Florida, you know, uh, pushing shuffleboard around or something of the sort. But, but, but I do what I can do anything in the world I want to do. But what I want to do is run Berkshire Hathaway. Now, why do I want to run it that way? A, I get to paint my own painting. You know, I go down there every day. And I feel like, you know, I feel like Michelangelo there, you know, working on the Sistine Chapel or something. Nobody else may think it's a great painting, but I get to paint my own painting. I do not have people second-guessing me. I do not have people saying, why don't you use a little more red paint than blue paint? Why don't you paint a seascape instead of a landscape? I get to do my own thing. I get the, it's, it's, it's a form of creativity. It, it's, it's exactly like somebody feels it's a professional golfer or somebody feels it's a painter. They're not doing it for the money, primarily. Uh, we've got a company, Flight Safety, that trains more pilots than anybody in the world. Flight Safety is run by an 85-year-old man, Al Yulshi. Al started the company with $10,000 in 1951. It now trains four or five times as many pilots, as uh, non-military pilots, as, any, as anybody in the world. And he is there at 85, and then it's a matter of public record, he's got a billion dollars worth of Berkshire shares. He works seven days a week. He loves it. And he loves it for the same reason that I love what I do. He gets to do it his way. He buys these big simulators that you train pilots in. He doesn't have to check with me as to whether to spend $15 million for a simulator. He doesn't ask me. He knows so much more about it than than I do. Why why in the world would he ask me? Well, I can't tell what kind of a plane I'm in, you know, when I'm flying around. And and Al is spending a couple hundred million dollars a year on simulators. Uh, so he's spending Berkshire Hathaway money, and he never checks with Omaha. He's never had to come to Omaha uh, for any kind of meetings. He runs his own business, and that's what he loves in life. And I let him do it. I mean, that's my contribution to it is is really turning loose his energies. And you know, they were properly directed before we bought the company seven or eight years ago. Why do? Why should I think that you know he couldn't keep running it after that? And like I say, at 85, he's still running it. And that feeling of ownership is really extraordinary, and it's so much better. I mean, it's the way I like to work, uh, and it's the way, you know, it's the way uh, Susan Jock likes to work, it's the way Al Yoshi likes to work. Somebody once said that the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. I had been terrified of public speaking. I couldn't do it, I'd throw up. And I knew if I didn't cure it then, I'd never cure it. And so I saw an ad in the paper for the Dale Carnegie course, which worked on developing your ability to speak in public. And I went down there. Be sincere. A good smile has the same effect as a puppy's tail. When a puppy wags. They made us do all these crazy things to get out of ourselves, and so we stood on tables and did all kinds of things. If I hadn't have done that, my whole life would have been different. So in my office, you will not see the degree I got from the University of Nebraska. You'll not see the master's degree I got from Columbia University, but you'll see the little award certificate I got from the Dale Carnegie course. You have over $100 billion of cash. 
Um, Berkshire and, does. Berkshire, yeah. 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 Maybe you do. Um, you, Berkshire has over $100 billion in cash, and you say that you always want this company to be a fortress. So how much cash should an ordinary investor have on a percentage basis, do you think? It, it depends on their personal situation. It, it, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you're working in something where you're, you're living off your, your, your paycheck from, from week to week, you want to have a little cash around, and, and you certainly don't want to have a credit card that's maxed out or anything like that. Uh, but if, you know, if, if your house is paid off, if you don't have big living expenses, you got a portfolio of, of decent, diversified businesses, uh, we really need any cash. Decent genes for certain things. And in my own case, I was sort of wired for capital allocation. And being wired for capital allocation a couple of hundred years ago in Nebraska wouldn't have been a thing. Uh, and, and even now being born in various parts of the world, it wouldn't have meant much. But here I was in this soon to be very rich capitalistic system. And, and it just so happened that what I did paid off enormously in a market system like we have. And I, if I'd had a talent in some other area that was way less commercial. I mean, I would have I would have had a good time doing it, but it wouldn't have paid off like this. But of course, Jay said it perfectly when he talked about, you know, he's in a recording for himself and the money comes afterwards. I mean, I I got to do what I love. I mean, and it doesn't get any luckier than that. If, 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 if you can spend your lifetime, right. and I'm 80 now, and doing things you love every single day. I mean, I, I would be doing what I did, what I do now, and I would have done it in the past. If the payoff had been in seashells or shark's teeth or anything else, it, it, if you can go to work every morning, I tap dance to work, you know, and I come down and I, I, every day is exciting. I, I was terrified, for example, both in high school and college. I don't know when it started, uh, but I became terrified of public speaking. And uh, I just couldn't do it. I mean, I, I, and so I arranged all my classes so I never had to <laughs> do any public speaking. <laughs> and I got to Columbia and I saw an ad in the paper uh, for Dale Carnegie course. And I went down, it was somewhere in the mid forties and I gave the guy a check for a hundred dollars and I went back and stopped payment. I lost my nerve. <laughs> and then I came out, I got out of Columbia actually when I was 20 and I came out to start selling securities in Omaha. And I realized I had to get up and be able to get up in front of people. I couldn't go through life this way. So I saw an ad again in the uh, local paper that there was a Dale Carnegie course being given. I went down and I gave the fellow a hundred dollars in cash and I became associated with 30 other people in the class. We couldn't stand up in front of a group and say our own name. I mean, it was, we were, it was pathetic. But that class changed my life in a big way. Wow. As a matter of fact, they used to give a pencil every week for whoever did the most with what they learned the previous week. And during that class, I proposed to my wife and she accepted and I won the pencil that week. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's important. I mean, there's certain, you've got to be able to communicate in life. Right. And it's enormously important. And probably the schools, to some extent, underemphasize that. I mean, you get mm -hmm. start going for an MBA, and people think it's kind of beneath them to teach you about communication. But if you can, if you can't communicate, if you can't talk to other people and get across your ideas or write, you know, you know you're you're giving up your potential. And uh, you know, anybody that's got a career potential of X, I, I guarantee it'll be 150 percent of X if they uh, if they really learn how to communicate well. So that was that was a big mm -hmm. a part. Of really succeeding in my career. If you want another amazing Warren Buffett video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.